The day began with a sea of faces. Thousands upon thousands of people. Because see, at this point in Christ's ministry, it was at its absolute zenith. He'd been teaching and preaching for a while, and he had a huge following. He was doing miracles like the people of God had not seen in hundreds of years. It was new life after a deafening silence. And even John the Baptist, who had caused quite a stir himself, had called him the Son of God. And so John's own followers had gone to pursue Jesus. He was healing the sick. He was challenging the establishment in the temple. He was full of promise. And so when John chapter 6 opens, there is a huge crowd. And the chapter gives us words for what that energy would have been like, what it would have felt like. In verse 2, it says, they kept following him wherever he went. In verse 5, it says they were coming to look for him. In verse 14, it says they hailed him as the prophet that they had been expecting. And when the chapter opens, it starts with the feeding of the 5,000, where he sits down 5,000 people on the grass, and he feeds them all with a sack lunch. And they're astounded, and they're sitting among the leftovers. And so even though he crosses the sea to get some distance in the nighttime, by dawn they have found him again. They are still with him. But by the end of this chapter, the crowd will be gone. All of them will have turned back, all but 12. So what happens? What happens between verse 25 and verse 66 that sends all of them away? What changes to shrink back that legion of followers? We're in this sermon series right now called Unbelievable, and we're exploring the roadblocks to faith. What stands in the way of us and pressing into a deeper faith? And in the first week, Pastor Dave taught us about fear. He said sometimes fear will hold us back. Fear of unmet expectations. Fear of unflattering stereotypes. Of unintended consequences. And then last week, Pastor Travis taught us about uncertainty. How sometimes if we just don't know what it looks like at the end, it's hard to go on that journey. If we don't know whether or not God's going to do the thing we've asked him to do. But today I want to explore a third obstacle to faith. The offense. How can my offended self stand between me and a deeper faith in Christ? Before I do that, would you pray with me? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. May you use your words, your words only, spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to do what only you can do, to show us how to be selfless. I ask this for myself and for my family and for everybody here. In Jesus' name, amen. So while everybody in that crowd of thousands came for one thing, they came to see Jesus. They actually came for lots of different reasons, and I want to point out three of them this morning. The first one is, some of them came with political motives. It says in John 6, 15, when Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away. See, at this point in their history, the nation of Israel is desperate to be restored. 
They are hungry to throw off Roman oppression. They have been living for decades under that thumb. And what they imagine the Messiah to be is this revolutionary who's going to rise up and stand against that. And so they want to fit Jesus into that framework. And they see their Messiah through that lens. And so for them, Jesus is a way, it's a mechanism to push that agenda forward. But others are there, the second reason, to meet physical needs. It says in verse 26, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you. Because see, they were a tired and a hungry people. They were hacking it out in a harsh world. They were living out that promise of Genesis 3 that by the sweat of your brow you will eat bread. They worked for everything that they had. And here, with Jesus, they got a break from that. Here was a man who was going to give them rest. Here was a man who was going to give them healing. Here was somebody who was going to feed and fill their bellies. And so they came wanting that. They came wanting what he would give them. But there's a third reason, too. Because, see, some were in the audience for religious affirmation. Verse 30 and 31, it says, they answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. And now I understand that that packs a lot of Old Testament references and we don't have the time to get into what they all mean here. But what I want the takeaway to be is that you have a people in his audience that are very familiar with the scriptures. And they're using the law of Moses and the prophets as a yardstick against which they want to judge Jesus. By this, he will either live or die. And by this, they will justify themselves. Now, I'm sure there were lots more than those three reasons. But what all of those have in common is that they say, what does faith do for me? See, it's a self-focused kind of faith. It says, I'm here because you have something to offer me. What can you do for me? And there's nothing wrong with that. I've admitted on this stage how that was how I spent all my first years at River Bend. I was tired and I had little, little, little kids and I changed careers and cities and all I wanted was to be fed. And I took that happily here. I'd sit and I'd gobble up the worship and I'd gobble up the sermons and I came to be filled and to be taught. It was wonderful. But what I didn't realize at the time, but I've come to see in, this, in the time since, is that I didn't, have, I didn't have the heart of an owner in this place. And I, I didn't even really have the heart of a participant in this place. I had the heart of a consumer in this place. And the only issue with that, now that I look back, is that I spent more energy on what wasn't working for me than what was. I've admitted I walked out when it wasn't Pastor Dave preaching because I was here for me. What can you give me? Is this worth my time? The people here are no different. The crowds of John 6 are this way too. Their experience of Jesus has not yet affected, has not chipped away at their self. And while their reasons for being there might have been self-interested, Jesus, interestingly, doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't send them away for that. He knows why they've come. But he challenges them and he invites them to take 
the next step. And so he says, I'm at verse 27. He says, you wanted to be with me because I fed you, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. In other words, think bigger. Aim higher than your self-interest. Because eternal life, the life that's bigger than this, it's bigger than politics, and it's bigger than the nine-to-five grind, and it's bigger than your next meal. I'm doing something bigger than your eyes have set themselves upon. But this challenge... It sets off this back and forth in this chapter between him and the crowd. They ask questions, trying to fit Jesus into their mold. And every time he answers saying, lay the mold down. And so he goes on, verse 38, for I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. He is boldly declaring here that he is who they think he is. He is the Son of God. He has come from heaven, sent by God to do a thing, and that thing is to invite them in, that all would come. It's an invitation to belief and an invitation to faith. But there's actually a more subtle, deeper invitation embedded here. Because he says, I have come not to do my own will. I'm God, but I have not come to do my own will, but the will of the Father. And with these words, he's inviting them to do the same. He's saying, I've done it first, follow my lead and lay yourself down Step out of yourself for a minute. It's bigger than all that. Consider that God is at work in a way that maybe you can't understand. Take a moment and just consider that maybe, maybe, just maybe, I'm at work in the world in a way that you didn't expect. That maybe I want to blow your paradigm apart. That maybe, just maybe, I want to use a youth pastor that looks rebellious to you to reach the rebellion in our youth. That maybe, just maybe, the revolution I'm interested in is the one inside you. But it's a bridge too far. The crowd does not like that. It wounds them somewhere in their self. And so instead of take the offer, they take offense. And there are three kinds of offense that happen right here in this chapter. The first one is with the person. It says in verse 42, they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and his mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? In other words, who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? They cannot believe that he has words of life for them because they know who he is. They think they know where he came from. They can't look past the human to see the activity of God. I know this is hard stuff. And I don't want to stand here and pretend that I am any different. I remember the first time I met Pastor Travis. 
And I didn't know hardly anything about him. I just knew that sometimes he stood in for Pastor Dave and we were supposed to meet up and so we met. And you know the thing that I couldn't get over? No, not his hair. Not his hair. You know the thing I couldn't get over? His shoelaces were untied. (laughs) Y'all, not just one, both of them. I mean, if it's one, it's an accident, right? But if it's two, I mean, that's a statement you're making, right? You're choosing a liability to make a statement. And I had, I just, none of it, none of it. I'm being honest. But you know what? It took a lot of time. It, it was after the shoelaces that I learned he lost his dad at 19. It was after the shoelaces that I learned he'd been living with leukemia. It was after the shoelaces that I learned he had the heart of a shepherd. That he was one of the most humble people I'd ever met. That I would be privileged and prayerful that he would still be in his position when my daughter became a young adult because I would love for her to sit with that man. I didn't know any of that. That took time. But see, Jesus is inviting them, give me the time. Just give me the time. Lay yourself down for a moment. The second kind of offense that they take is with his words. Now, chapter 6 is long and convoluted, and a lot happens in it that I can't get into. But one of the things that Jesus says is, I am the bread of life. I am the bread come down from heaven to give you life. And the life that I will give you is my flesh. And unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in yourself. Now see, these were really heavy words. And they were extremely offensive and provocative because this crowd... This crowd, most of them held to the law of Moses that said it was a violation of the law to drink blood or to eat flesh with its lifeblood in it. What he said was patently offensive. But I believe he was purposefully provocative. I believe he was pressing in to their sensibilities with intention. But they say in verse 52... Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. See, rather than hope that it was figurative, rather than recognize the sacrificial language of the statements, rather than press him for their meaning, rather than open their hearts and their minds to maybe see that it was echoing the language of Isaiah. They just choose to take him literally. They let that be the ground on which they stake their claim. And they refuse to look past the words to discover the heart and the purpose behind them. But the third kind of offense they take is with the hardship Verse 60, it says, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining, so he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken our spirit, and life. Some translations read, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? They couldn't look past the difficulty of it. And Jesus asks, does this offend you? Gosh, it's hard stuff. It's hard stuff, but it's supposed to be. Because when we get too embedded in our paradigm, when we think that we get to decide who God is and what he should do and what he should affirm in us, 
or when we decide what our church is or should do or should affirm in us, when we think we get to decide what it looks like, it's really easy to take offense. It's really easy to play the critic and be dissatisfied. What they wanted, he wouldn't give. And what he offered, they would not receive. They wanted to fit him into their framework, and they wouldn't change to fit into his. And so we come to verse 66. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to leave? In a single day, thousands turned into twelve. But you know, Jesus was never concerned about popularity, and he didn't care about the numbers. He wasn't polling his followers to find out what, what they wanted to hear next. He had a singular focus, and that was to do the will of the Father who sent him. And I love Peter's response because he says, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. What I love about that is he doesn't say where, he says to whom. Because for Peter, it's about the person. He knows that this is his redeemer. And there's no pursuit, and there's no pleasure, and there's no life outside of that. If we're going to go further in our faith, if we're going to get over the roadblocks to press into something deeper, It requires of us that we lay our offenses down. It requires of us that we pressed past some of that discomfort of it not looking like we thought it would. Lay down our offenses to seek not the Jesus we were expecting, but the one we weren't. But you know what? In this chapter... Jesus is letting us know that there's actually a farther still. There's actually farther than that. Because with his words and with his life, what he's saying is it's not that I think of myself less. It's that I don't think of myself at all. Wherever, whenever, whatever, I'm unoffendable. I am fully available. I am all in. I am the sacrificed self. I want to close with an excerpt from C.S. Lewis. This is from his essay, Three Kinds of Men. He writes, there are three kinds of people in the world. The first class is of those who live simply for their own sake and pleasure, regarding man and nature as so much raw material to be cut up into whatever shape may serve them. In the second class are those who acknowledge some other claim upon them, the will of God, the categorical imperative, or the good of society, and honestly try to pursue their own interests no further than this claim will allow. They try to surrender to the higher claim as much as it demands, like men paying a tax, but hope, like other taxpayers, that what is left over will be enough for them to live on. Their life is divided, like a soldier's or a schoolboy's, into time on parade and off parade, in school and out of school. But the third class is of those who can say, like St. Paul, that for them to live is Christ. These people have got rid of the tiresome business of adjusting the rival claims of self and God by the simple expedient of rejecting the claims of self altogether. The old egoistic will has been turned around, reconditioned, and made into a new thing. 
The will of Christ no longer limits theirs. It is theirs. All their time in belonging to him belongs also to them, for they are his.